Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome back to the Full Maps Conversations, our series of chats with leading scholars in the field. With me today is Melanie Kamet, a professor at Brown University and author of the new book, Compassionate Communalism, Welfare and Sectarianism in Lebanon. Melanie, welcome to GW. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. So let's talk about your book, um, Compassionate Communalism. What were you doing when you went out into the field and started studying these uh, social services in Lebanon? Well, I should say that I initially got interested in the topic because of uh, events in Iraq in 2003. So it didn't huh. start with Lebanon. Uh, what happened was after the U.S. invasion in spring of 2003, I noticed uh, some reports about how various newly formed political parties and movements were taking over previous public welfare institutions, health care uh, facilities and so forth. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting phenomenon that you had this relatively robust uh, public sector welfare system in Iraq that was getting dismantled and taken over by these non-state actors or newly formed political actors. And it seemed like a difficult proposition to go in and really study that in Iraq in the 2000s. Yeah. And, uh, and I realized, having visited Lebanon once or twice previously, that this might actually be an interesting question to study there. So I did some exploratory research trips. I interviewed a lot of people. I went and met uh, political parties and groups running the facilities themselves. And, and that's how I got going on the project. Um, and it started with really qualitative research, um, interviewing, looking at published sources, and then I started to integrate some more quantitative components to the project, so it became a sort of full-fledged mixed methods project, as we say in political science. So what you wanted to find out was kind of what are these political parties doing mm -hmm. with these social services? Why are they running clinics mm -hmm. and, and daycare centers and that sort of thing? Right. So, so what, what did you find out? Yeah, so I mean, the, the larger question that really interests me is what do people do when they don't have a big public welfare infrastructure? What do they do when their states are either collapsing or never existed in the first place to really mm -hmm. assure their basic uh, economic uh, security? And so the question that interested me is who gets access to services under those conditions? How do these non-state actors or political actors that kind of traverse the state non-state boundary, how do they deliver services and what does this mean for equity and the experience that people have in trying to access their basic needs or meet their basic needs? And so I really looked at the what we might call the supply side, the distribution or allocation of benefits more than the effects of distributing these benefits on people politically or socially. Uh, and what I found is that, not surprisingly, there is discretionary access to social welfare in the sense that these political actors in particular do not dole out uh, uh, welfare benefits or social benefits or social goods in a sort of equitable manner or based on socioeconomic need solely. Um, that is definitely a factor, partly because they take it into consideration and partly because you tend to see needier people going to them for services. The wealthier components of society tend to go to for-profit institutions. But different groups behave in different ways, though, is, yes. is what you argue. Yes. Yeah, so, so one of the major arguments I make is that different types of parties allocate benefits in different ways. And so when you're a party, for example, that is most concerned with electoral politics, with winning formal state institutions and, and participating in formal state institutions or holding uh, formal offices, then you tend to be more inclusive in your distributional strategy. You tend to try to capture more people in your social welfare You're network. You're aiming at those swing voters, people who you might win over. Yes. So you, we might think of it in that way. So more marginal supporters, people that aren't their established hardcore support base. Um, and also another factor that I introduce in the book is when you have competition from a rival from your community, and keep in mind this book is, uh, I did this research in a place where ethnic and religious uh, uh, identities are highly politicized, in fact institutionalized in the right. state. Um, so, so when you have a rival from your in-group community, who's trying to you know, become the dominant actor in your community, then you have this incentive to be a better representative of the in-group than that person. It's kind of an outbidding dynamic. So that's another factor that affects the allocation of benefits. 
Now, we were talking about this before. The, uh, this becomes very dependent on the Lebanese context uh, mm -hmm. with those institutionalized identities. And mm -hmm. if you're a Shia party in Lebanon, you're not trying to compete for the votes of the Christians or the Sunnis. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty different from what you're seeing in other, in, in Egypt or uh, or yeah. uh, the West Bank or something like that. Yes, I mean, there's definitely some scope conditions to this argument in the sense that it wouldn't apply to all places at all time, especially the part about in-group competition, which is really contingent on a power-sharing kind of political system uh, where there's an incentive to become the dominant actor representing a given ethnic or religious community. But I do think the larger argument about electoral versus non-electoral or what I call state-centric versus extra-state political strategies can travel. Um, in the sense that uh, when you are trying to win uh, elected political offices and hold formal state institutions or control them, you do have an incentive to reach out more broadly, whereas when you're playing militia politics or are less concerned about winning public offices, then you uh, tend to focus more on your hardcore supporters. So that argument, I think, travels more yeah. broadly. So did you see any evidence uh, that religion made a difference, that uh, kind of more religious parties ran more social services or were better at running social services? Yeah, so I mean, that's an interesting question that I can't say I really addressed uh, in this project, but it's a question that fascinates me that I'm turning to towards uh, turning towards now. So um, there was some anecdotal evidence for sure that certain political actors uh, were more effective or certain religious actors were more effective. But I didn't see from at least my qualitative work and this anecdotal evidence that there was any consistent pattern with respect to a type of actor. So for example, some people say, oh, faith-based actors are superior providers because they have more motivated staff who work for less mm -hmm. and put in longer hours and so forth and are more committed. I can't say that my initial research has confirmed that because I looked at the facilities of lots of religious actors and saw a lot of variation. Um, but there is some evidence that some political actors, like Hezbollah, for example, do provide services quite effectively. And I think that's an interesting question to pursue in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it about these organizations that might shape their provision? Do, do you see any evidence that it actually is a winning political strategy? that providing these services actually did win votes or actually did help them compete with other you know, in-group competitors? Yes. I mean, uh, this is not a question I explored as systematically as the allocation strategies, but there's definitely some evidence of that. First of all, there's national surveys that have been conducted that show that people uh, expect their political officials and political groups, more generally sectarian parties in particular in the case of Lebanon, to provide for them. I mean, that is very clear that that is an expectation across the board uh, that has something to do with the nature of welfare regimes and the political system there. And I don't think it's unique to Lebanon whatsoever. Um, and then there is some evidence uh, from um, turnout data, voter turnout data that I saw um, that suggests that it does work. So for example, when the um, future movement associated with the Hariri family would go into an area and open up services, you would see more voter turnout in that area in subsequent election, presumably as a response to a turnout buying strategy on the part of the welfare, um, uh, uh, on the part of the political party. But your interviews with political party leaders suggest that they think it pays off. Absolutely. And, and then they'd say this to me point blank. Even the ones that had less developed welfare programs would say, we know we have to do this. We know we have to constitute this or reconstitute this welfare dimension of our activities. No, that, that's interesting. I mean, you know, if you compare it to a place like Egypt, mm -hmm. where you have Muslim brothers and Salafis out there running these kinds of clinics and running these kinds of services, leftist parties not really doing that so much. Mm -hmm. It's just a very different context, and yes. you wonder if the if the lessons would apply yeah. when you move from a Lebanon to an Egypt, or yeah. to a, even or even to a Yemen, a place where you similarly have a very weak state. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some ways, Lebanon in, has always been viewed as an outlier in the political economy types of the region because it has a much uh, more robust role for the private sector, a much uh, less developed role for the state in the welfare regime, in the economy. But given the progressive uh, deconstruction of the state in economic and social welfare activities over the last few decades, 
some aspects of what's been going on in Lebanon for decades actually look more and more like what is happening in other countries in the region. There's a much larger role for non-state actors, for private for-profit, for non-profit for non actors, and the provision of social services. Now, you said that uh, this is where you, some of your research is going now, mm -hmm. towards uh, kind of these broader questions of public health and, uh, and, and kind of the trends across the region. Yes. And so what do you think the really interesting questions are there? Yeah, so I think there's a number of interesting questions, and I'm working on several projects that, broadly speaking, focus on health and governance, or governance and health, mm -hmm. in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so one of my projects that I've just piloted in Lebanon, the data has just come in, looks at the quality of primary health care provision by uh, the full array of public and private actors uh, in Lebanon. Not so much uh, for-profit private mm -hmm. actors, but not-for-profit private actors, uh, NGOs, charities, political parties, the public sector, et cetera. And so uh, what I'm going to be looking at in that data is do we see systematic variation in the quality of care? And I've right. spent some time working on uh, public health issues to try to understand how you measure the quality of care. But also some other projects related to how does governance at the national or the local level affect both access to care, the quality of care, and uh, potentially even health outcomes in the long run. I mean, one of the arguments that people make is that you see the rise of these of these uh, you know, social services mm -hmm. you know, coming from outside of the state precisely because the state has failed so badly. Mm -hmm. you know, public hospitals are terrible or mm -hmm. they, you know, the neoliberalism has meant the shrinking of the state and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Is that roughly what you see happening or do you see it more as uh, you know, kind of a, a partnership between civil society and states and international organizations? Yes. I mean, I think that's a very context-specific question. Um, so in the case of Lebanon, you can't say it's due to the decline of the state because the state was never fully articulated here. Sure. Um, but certainly in other cases where you had more developed welfare regimes, like in Egypt, for example, you have seen the rise of a charitable sector, not that it didn't exist before, but really a much more robust charitable sector, mm -hmm. some of which is linked to political actors, some of which is linked to just more purely charitable actors, religious or otherwise. Um, so I think that really depends on the context we're talking about. And it's going to become even more, I mean, that context is mm -hmm. going to become even more compelling in, when you look at the failure of states uh, everywhere yes. from Yemen, Libya, Iraq, and Syria. Yes. I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of, Serb, of people now in refugee communities and displaced communities that just don't have access to yeah. basic human needs and, and health care and mm -hmm. all of these things. And that's, that falls on the international community and on local communities in ways that the mm -hmm. state is simply not present for. Yes, but the irony is that in order to make non-state uh, provision work well, be equitable, be effective, you actually need a robust role for the state. You need an effective regulatory capacity or a state with effective regulatory capacity to make that work. So we've seen this in political economy debates the world over. You know, does globalization mean the state is disappearing? No, it means that the role of the state is changing and right. the same holds true here. Your, your research in Lebanon didn't uh, go through the period where the Syrian refugees started coming in in large numbers, did it? No. The research for this book ended in roughly 2009. So this predates that experience, but the uh, surveys that I ran this past spring and summer did touch on this a little uh, because there were Syrian refugees coming to the facilities where the team was doing interviews. Unfortunately, we couldn't really speak to the refugees because uh, the Institutional Review Board at the American University in Beirut said you can't talk to this vulnerable population and so we agreed to that as part of the human subjects approval process. Yeah, I imagine this is going to be a, a major issue uh, going forward though. Absolutely. All right, well, well thank you. I'm Melanie Kamet, Brown thank University, uh, author of Compassionate Communalism, Welfare and Sectarianism in Lebanon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much.